All right, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our third session of the Forage Forum Fridays. Uh, we're excited to have you again with us today. Sorry, my reminder of this event. So, um, so I'm excited to have you guys with us today. Um, we're going to start off here with Mark Kepler. Um, he's our Ag and Natural Resource Educator, County Extension Director, and Interim 4-H Educator over in Fulton County right now. Um, so we're incredibly excited to have Mark with us. He has a wealth of forage knowledge. And so with that, Mark, I'll let you take it away. Well, thank you very much, Alicia. I appreciate that. And I, we're going to go through a variety of things this morning. And I'm going to talk mostly about holistic forages. And I... I, I I always interested in the way they spell holistic is spell it with an H rather than a W. And to me, it's the holistic. And that's the way we need to look into forage production is look at the whole parts of it rather than, and ra rather than just specific parts. So many times we pay attention to little things and, and how do we do this, but how does that little thing fit into the whole system. And that's part of what I'm gonna go into today. And I'm gonna start out this presentation with a cold earth. Uh, cold earth, because if we go back in our history, and I believe if you don't understand your history, it's hard to see what your future is gonna be like. But that one time 600 million years ago, this is what the earth may have looked like at that time. It was just all frozen is what it was. And so obviously there's no forages, no trees, no nothing going on in that world. Take it ahead about 300 million years later, and it's totally done a change. And then in, at this point, what's going on is there's carbon everywhere in the air. The world is hot, plants are flourishing, and the coal that we dig out of the ground today came from 300 million years ago when this world was, was a nice, warm, carbony place. And, and plants grew up, died and fell to the earth and eventually turned into our coal pits. So that's what it was like at that time. Then we go back to just 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago, the glaciers came in to our part of the world and we're in Northern Indiana. It's where I'm located at. Uh, but this is, a, this is the picture of the Wisconsin glacier coming down through there. So they wiped out everything that was in here with these great big thick glaciers. And as they receded and as they went back, what they left behind is what Indiana was primarily for um, after that 10,000 year ago glacier. And that's just one great big woods. The forest just absolutely covered Indiana with a few exceptions. There was some prairie and of course Purdue University in West Lafayette is one of those areas that was a prairie. But these are deciduous hardwood trees, not pines, none of those evergreens whatsoever, but deciduous hardwood trees that just packed the whole state of Indiana. And as the pioneers came in here, they would have accounts of, we could never see the sun because all we could see was the trees. And the only time we ever saw the sun is when we came to the rivers. And I, and I think that's really interesting. But that is where our soils came from, are those trees growing here for that extended long period of time. And so if I go into a woods right now, and I dig a hole in the woods, and I look down at what's in that hole in that woods, this is pretty much what I will see. Uh, well, first off, I would mention that tree that's growing there. Let's see if I can get this over to a uh, laser pointer. There we go. I got a laser pointer. That tree that's growing right there, if you really look at it, and people ask me about how trees grow, if you take that tree and you lay it down, that's how far the roots go. The roots 90% of them are in the top foot of the ground. Yes, you do get a few roots that go down deep, but the vast majorities are in that top of foot of ground. And that's where this term topsoil comes from. Thousands of years of leaves falling down, uh, decaying, and the roots going out fairly well flat across the surface. And those roots are then reutilizing the carbon that's already in those leaves. Plus those roots die and, and um, rot away. And there we have that carbon in our soil. So all the organic matter we have in our soil comes from those trees that were there. If you take a even closer look at it, this is the state soil of Indiana, a Miami silt loam. And you can see as you go down in here, at some point, those tree roots, the topsoil, 
just all of a sudden cuts off and stops. And below that is the subsoil that's down into that area. So this is what a forested soil would look like, all this beautiful topsoil. And, and that's what the farmers would come in there and would do. In fact, when those farmers came in, what they would do is they would plow up this soil. And the soil was just full of fluffy, fluffy leaves. And, and, and it, was, it was interesting and thick that was there. Now, if you walk across your pasture fields this April, and get out there after a rainy night and have your flashlight out looking for calves and cows or whatever animals might be getting born in the middle of the night you're going to come across this picture and this is a picture of a couple of night crawlers getting together and mating and reproducing and and it's really neat because the minute you shine the light on them boom they're gone they're out of there they just suck right back into the holes with the other tail ends of them are on and so we're used to having night crawlers around but the interesting fact to me is these guys are an introduced species. When the pioneers came into this area, when the, well, first off, when the glaciers came in, they wiped out everything, and there are no more earthworms around here. When the pioneers started coming into this area, they brought with them on soil and dirt and a variety of other things, they brought earthworms into this area. And earthworms have really changed the whole picture of how our world is. It's a good deal, bad deal situation. Now I'll talk about the, the what it looked like. So this this is a Minnesota forest. They don't have earthworms up there. They haven't found it yet. You see, it's a very dense forest. It's if you can look at the forest floor, you can have a whole bunch of fluffy leaves all over the place. Well, you walk into my woods in northern Indiana, and that's what it looks like there. There is not all that fluffy forest leaves there because of the earthworm and the earthworm activity. So the people who are true purists when it comes to a forest say that the earthworms are a bad deal because they've changed what our forest is like. So I look a little closer here and what have they really done? In your forest, in my forest, there's a little pile of leaves kind of humped up there. And then the next thing I see is I pull the top off of that or pull the leaves off of that and get down to it. And then I have this little round thing here. And then I pull it off even further and I see these holes right there. That's where the night crawlers have come up, grab a few leaves and pull them right back down the hole is what they've ended up doing. And so they are recycling those leaves down into the soil. And that's what is, happens in our pastures too. The night crawlers come up, grab something and take it down into the pastures. And they improve our soils and our hay fields and pastures, corn fields. They do a tremendously good job with it. On the flip side, they're actually hurting us some, some ways in our forested situations. That's what night crawlers are. And, and I also want to go back to this picture here. This is a picture that was taken on my farm uh, uh, just a few years back. And this is if you, a hole that was dug for a soil judging contest. So the 4 Hers and FFAers were out there for the soil judging contest. And they dug this down in the depressional area. And if you go down deep enough, almost a yardstick long down here, you get to a point, there is the original topsoil. That 10,000 years of trees growing, that's the original topsoil. This piece of farm granite has been farmed for 200 years. In 200 years, <coughs> excuse me a second. And in 200 years, I farm very little, all that soil has eroded into this thing and covered up the topsoil. And so I think one of the greatest things that we can do to our soils is keep it as a forest. And the second best thing we can do is keep it as forages. And at the time this picture was taken, this field had been in forages for 25 years continuously. And even though all the forages are helping out this soil profile, right down there is the original topsoil. This is all eroded off of a steep hill coming into that 12% slope, fairly steep slope coming into that field. So uh, I, I think we need to do a lot of things to help protect our soils. And I think forages are an excellent method for us to have to, to improve our soils and keep this kind of thing from happening. So let's go back to my earthworms. This is a, 
uh, slide that came out of Europe. They used the word lay, which is pasture essentially. They had this field that had no earthworms in it whatsoever. And so what they ended up doing is they added earthworms into the situation. And by adding those earthworms in there, they, they took that soil and, um, and they looked at it and they improved tremendously how much production that soil was by just having these earthworms in here. Um, and I think it's something like they've got, um, yeah, it's like a few years later, they were able to do that and they have improved the soil properties by just adding those earthworms. But it's not just earthworms that are in our soil. There is a viable community of organisms everywhere from fungi to protozoa, beetles, worms, earthworms, centipedes, ants, ground beetles, all these things that are working in our soils. And, and we try to do the best we can to preserve those things. That ground beetle that's there is a, 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 an animal that eats up other insects. And so some of the bad stuff that we have in our soil, those ground beetles do a great job with. Lots of times nowadays you hear about this soil inhabiting insect, and this is a dung beetle. And what this dung beetle is doing, when the animal defecates, the dung beetle goes out there, rolls it all up into a ball, and really helps that defecation, that manure that's on there, break down faster by their actions and their activities, rather than having this one big plot of manure there that's smothering out the grasses and the forages, these guys are out there working on it. And so we really see in our discussions today of how, how well soils are and we want to look at our soil's health. We can take a look at the, the, the fungi activity and what's going on and how it's developing inside of that soil. So I'll go to the next step. There's something out there called mycorrhizae fungi. And if, on the left-hand picture, we have this plant growing there that's grass that's got some roots going down. And then on the right side picture, we essentially have the same grass growing there, but we have an example of this mycorrhizae network, a fungal mycorrhizae network. Now, you know, I'm an extension educator. When I talk fungus, it's always something bad. Well, this is the good part of funguses. And what we have is these mycelium of the fungus out there, and it just colonizes around the roots and into the roots, both. And by doing that, we can draw all sorts of nutrients out of that area into those roots that the roots can't reach because the hyphae does the job for it. And so that mycorrhizae fungi is out there and it's important, but we can destroy it very easily. And that's what we're going to talk about here as we go along. So look at this piece of soil, it really looks beautiful. It's been in soil for a pasture for a long period of time. And I could just go in there with my hands and I could just crumble that, so nice. This is a network and in there's all those bacteria and protozoa and insects that we're not seeing, worm channels that are going down through there, root channels, just a viable network of insects and funguses and all sorts of organisms going on and it's so nice to feel because it just crumbles in your hands that's what we really would love to have uh, when we go in and plow up something like that we just destroy all that and and so if we can encourage people not to be doing that that's a great thing to have to do so Mycorrhizae fungi, there are all different kinds of mycorrhizae fungi and I just look up these pictures I got goats sheep and cattle here well they're all ruminants but they're all uniquely different animals. And so mycorrhizae fungi are just the exact same thing. They are all unique and different animals to take a look at. And so there's different ones in our soils. So a lot of our plant species will have a variety of these mycorrhizae fungi. Some of these fungi work in the plant in other words, that hyphae goes right into the plant, and some work outside the plant. The hyphae comes up next to them, but they all are drawing things up to it. Some plants have none, and this is one that doesn't have any, and it's the dreaded pigweed. This is the guy I don't want to see in my pasture. I don't like pigweed because it has associated properties like it can be poisonous, and it, and it can also have nitrate toxicities associated with it, so I do not like to have pigweed around. So in my own pastures, I, I want to stay away from that. And with these mycorrhizae fungi, this nutrient exchange can occur between the plants and the species. It keeps going on. 
and it exists out there. And when we go in and we no-till or we plant something into that without ripping it up and plowing it up, we're already going to have that fungi there to nurture our seedings as they go along. So if you think about pasture renovation, it already takes advantage of what's out there and available. Ah, this is a picture of Hiroshima. Hiroshima, this is active picture of Hiroshima. And then they dropped the bomb on it and it looked like this. And in some ways, I think of plowing a field in this same kind of context. Probably some of the, all the items that we saw in the last picture are there, but they're all messed up and, and they have been destroyed and the functioning systems and the, and the um, organic nature of the whole process is now gone with it. And so that's what plowing will do to something. So if I look at my pasture, I may have a pasture that needs renovating. One of the things that I see right here in this and is dandelions. I call dandelions an indicator plant. It indicates that I've got some issues out there. Um, if I see a lot of dandelions popping up in a pasture, then it may be time for me to think about renovating that pasture because at some point I will have grazed that pasture down too bad and it really didn't come back from it. So I have a field that had four rotations in it and always number three had the most dandelions. So at some point, I don't know what I did, but I messed up and I grazed that too hard and the dandelions came back through it. So maybe now uh, after 25 years, this pasture, it is time to renovate it. And I may want to look into renovating that pasture. Well, this was a not that pasture. This was another one. And I decided it was time to, um, in my younger days, just to rip it up. And so I did that. In fact, this is an area that hadn't been ripped up for a long period of time. I went into that area and I planted this, this cover, this cover crop mixture, they call it a pollinator crop. Well, it had buckwheat and a variety of other things into it. But because I ripped it up, this guy right here is in the square is the thing that just come powering right through and that's pigweed. That pigweed that does not have any mycorrhizae fungi, that doesn't add to the situation, that just pops through with the seed bank that's been there for, uh, I don't know, tens and tens of years in that area. There's pigweed, there's pigweed, over here's pigweed, and I had a lot of pigweed popping through on it. If I would not have plowed that ground, if I would have no-tilled into that ground, I wouldn't have had a big issue with the pigweed coming through there. So I, I, I just think about this, not only is it a weed, but it just doesn't contribute anything to the mycorrhizae fungi aspects of that pasture field. So here's another one that I plowed up. And this time around, I went in with brown midrib sorghum. Uh, I raise goats on my farm. I also have beef cattle. And one of the things I know through research work that I have done or reading that I have done going to meetings is that brown midrib sorghum is an excellent sorghum for goats. And so I am now pasturing on this, but I ripped this one up, but you don't see the pigweed popping up through this because I learned a long time ago, if you're going to rip it up like that, maybe you need to put, increase the, increase the number of seedlings that you have out there by increasing the seeding rate. So we put a lot of seeding seed into this to get this really nice thick stand. So this field now today, this was taken several years ago, this field has been rotated into a permanent field. If you're going to use brown midrib sorghum, it is an annual. You plant it in May, and by the following late September, it's going to die, and that's the end of it. And so it's a great crop because it will get three times the size we've got here in this picture. It gets us a lot of tonnage, but we keep having to renovate and get into it over and over and over. So that means you either have to plow it or you have to go back in and maybe spray it and no-till it into that situation. But then again, you know, I like to have a thick stand. So it's a great product. But I think the next part of this and the next slide I have is a one that was at a cover crop field day that we had. And here was a whole bunch of different cover crops. And at the same time, they were going out and they were going to turn, they did turn cattle in on this because they took this green matter and were able to eat this up. So when you put a variety of different plants in there, what that variety does is helps out with that mycorrhizae fungi. It helps out with the whole environment because we got different roots requiring different things 
And so we have a, a vast array of different forages there. And so they add to the whole soil structure by having a multiple varieties there. And I, and I think that's very good for a cover crop. And I've seen people do this on cover crop. When I go into a pasture field in Northern Indiana, alfalfa orchard grass are just absolutely the best things. And this is what I've tried to do for years. Uh, I never have liked the pasture mixes that have five or six or seven different things in them because I think they have them uh, eventually as you pasture it, the, some of the species get ate out, other species come on. Um, but I really have kind of changed my thoughts through the years that I would like to have alfalfa orchard grass, but I'd like to have a few other things in there. Maybe not in great huge quantities, but just a few, a red clover for sure. Absolutely, I would put red clover into this situation, but maybe I'll put in a few other things that, into that perennial stand that might be here. A lot of things you see in this picture are annuals, they're grazed or they're just there for cover crops. But as we get into perennials, I try to incorporate just a few more different things. Goats, I love chicory. And I will be putting chicory into this in this pasture too, when we put those those pastures together. So think about this from that standpoint. Think about this from a holistic standpoint when you get into your pasture. In fact, that's what my last slide is: is just thinking. Um, now, this is probably me thinking about what did I do with my clothes, but <laughs> this is this is what you need to do: just stop and think about where you're going, what you want to do. I have tried a variety of pasture mixers in my place. I have changed them around and did different ones, different seating rates, different times. There are about nine, eight different pastures around my house with eight different concoctions in it. Um, from time to time, I have got triticale there. This, this is my first year for trying triticale. I have brown midrib sorghum. I have the summer perennial grasses, the big, the, the Indian grass and those types. I just started those last year. So we're going to see what it's like. But I encourage you to take a look at this from a holistic standpoint. Try a variety of different things and try to get some good mixtures together and try out those different things. So think about what you're doing. Alicia. All right. Thank you, Mark. So does anybody have any questions or any comments for Mark? You must have done a fantastic job, Mark. <laughs> They're all asleep. I'm sorry. So um, just wanted to kind of give you guys a little I guess a background into what our, our world was like in this area. So I've just launched a little poll if you guys could answer that question real quick for us. Um, so just kind of wanted to look at kind of that basics, kind of that background of where at least our land in Indiana came from. Um, so it kind of supports some of what we talked about in the first class with our soils, um, talked some about our forage species selections last week with Brooke, and kind of leads into our kind of renovation reestablishment type talk that we'll have here in just a moment. So. All right. I see that Brooke's a earthworm mound connoisseur. Just a <laughs> side note, and I don't want to take too much time, but we, in extension, we do a lot of different things and work with a lot of people and we go out and see home lawns. And I always have people that call me up and say, my home lawn is lumpy. I don't understand why it's lumpy out there. <laughs> and so we go out there, we lay down on our belly and we look into the ground and we find those earthworm mounds that are making those lumps. And then the next question is, well, how do I get rid of them? You don't get <laughs> rid of them. You don't want to ever get rid of them. Yep. yep, yep. That's one of my favorite things when I do pasture walks and things like that is to go out there and, and sort through the cow patties and things like that just to see what, what those dung beetles are doing, what the earthworms are doing. So it's always, there's a lot more out there than just grass and crap. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you, Mark, very much. So get started with this next section here. So. All right, so I get the pleasure of speaking to you guys this afternoon. 
Um, so I'm going to be talking kind of about, I titled this re-establishment of pastures, um, because when we're looking at both establishment and kind of the renovation of our pastures, a lot of our steps are going to be similar, um, so we can kind of follow along the same track. So, so when we look at our pastures, look at our hay fields, things like that, which would you rather have? Would you rather have something that looks like this in either of these two photos, or would you prefer to have something that looks like this? Something that's lush, something that's green, that's like Mark said, doesn't have a lot of extra weeds, that has the forage that our animals need, um, whether we're cutting it for hay production, haylage, baleage, things like that, or if we're going to be grazing it. Personally, I'd rather have it look like this. Um, so these are actually photos from my parents' farm. Um, they took some cropland, um, about, well, all of their land. Um, they have about 40 acres. Um, at one time it was cropland and some hay fields with a few pastures and they've turned it all into a rotational grazing system in the last, I've got to think how old I am, <laughs> in the last 15 years. Um, so they've done a lot of work um, to kind of renovate, rejuvenate their fields, things like that. But for me, looking at a lush green field just looks so much better than something that's going to be thistly and thorny. So, so when we begin um, looking at reestablishment, things like that, our method used for establishing perennial forages can certainly make a difference between a long-lived stand and or something that's not going to last long, that's not going to have the species that we want. So you want to make sure that you have a uniform stand. You want to make sure you have an adequate number of plants in order to get your maximum yield. Um, so like Mark talked about with his brown rib sorghum, um, he ended up having to up the number of seeds just so he could get that good canopy cover to eliminate any extra weed species, especially the pigweed. So like we've talked about, you wanna make sure you have your appropriate seeding rate and we'll talk about calibrating our drill. Thanks for the prompt last week, Brooke, <laughs> um, at the end of this talk. And then we'll have suitable fertilization. Um, so like Brad talked about, we wanna make sure that we have soil tests done, make sure we know what our pH is, make sure we have good fertilization for that seed going in the ground. And that will basically maximum, maximize our odds for establishment or renovation success. So there are a few things um, and we see this chart from Dr. Keith Johnson. And so there are a few things we wanna look at when we're looking at pasture management, looking at possibly reestablishing, renovating or establishing a pasture to start with. So what are things that you're doing right currently? What are things that could be done better when we're looking at our pastures and hay fields? So are you soil testing and fertilizing based on those soil test results? Um, do you know those major soil types? So looking at that web soil survey that Kenny talked about in the first, first week. Um, are there major forages growing in my pasture um, that I enjoy? Or are there some out there that maybe aren't doing as well? They may be growing well, but my animals don't enjoy them. Um, making sure that you're managing your forage as well, um, cutting or grazing down to the correct height, that you aren't cutting down too far, damaging the crowns, damaging the roots, things like that. Um, if you are grazing um, and you do plan to stockpile to try to graze through some of the winter, are you making sure you're pulling your animals off early enough um, to get that good stockpile of forages to get you through part of the winter? Do you go out and actually take a look at how your pastures or hay fields are growing? Um, it's nice to kind of do that 55 mile an hour drive by, um, if, especially if the field isn't necessarily right by your home. Um, just say, oh yeah, it's green, it's growing. We'll go out and cut next week or we'll turn the animals out there next week. Actually stop, take a look at what's out there growing. It may be green, but it may not be what you want to be out there. Um, or if you have your animals out there grazing, or if you've just harvested the field, how quickly is it growing back? What is growing back? Things like that are what we need to consider. Um, making sure we're documenting. So when did you take that cutting of hay? When did you move those animals onto and off that pasture? Um, things like that. So if we find out if we're grazing and you're seeming to have to move your animals a little more often than what you may have done the last couple of years, it may be that your yield is starting to decrease. 
that you just don't have the same stand quantity that you used to. So that may be something you need to look into. If you're harvesting forages, um, keep track of kind of what the yield is that you get off that field. If it's starting to kind of decline a little bit, kind of look at what the weather has been this last year. Um, I mean, look at the last five years in Indiana. I mean, for us up here, especially in Northern Indiana, Northeast Indiana, things like that, kind of where Mark and I are, last year ended up being a drought year for us. Um, so my husband and I, we do have some hay fields that we rent that we, that we harvest from. Um, some friends of ours had 50 acres of hay that they cut. Um, they got two round bales off of that 50 acres during one of the later cuttings last year. They weren't pushing it. It's just what they got. Um, so for us up here last year, drought was definitely a major issue. We're still abnormally dry up here. Um, so for all of you that may be in Southern Indiana that have been blessed maybe with some excess rain, we'd greatly appreciate it up here. <laughs> um, so then we also look at where possible um, and applicable um, graze crop residues, um, double crop the forages, things like that, like Brooke talked about last week. So if we have a neighboring farmer that we could go in after he's harvested wheat and maybe do a cover crop of some brassicas, things like that, that we could go in and um, use as our own forage, something like that could work out. Look at nutrient compositions of the hay. So if you are harvesting hay, what is it that you're pulling off? What is that hay worth? What's its value? And then if you do um, have somebody, have an agronomist, have somebody that knows what they're looking at in terms of the numbers, your fertilizer, your hay components, things like that. Have somebody that you can go to talk to if you don't fully understand it. Um, that can just kind of explain how, what's on your farm and how it can be improved. So those are just some, some things to consider when you're looking at your pastures and hay fields. So I'm going to briefly, very briefly, go back over species and site selection. Brooke did a great job last week talking about species um, and kind of where they need to grow and such. So just a few questions we need to consider when we're looking at some of our species, looking at our site selection, things like that, are kind of what's your end goal? Um, so let's say you have a pasture out there. It's a, you think it's doing okay, but what do you really want it to do? Do you have an end goal in mind? Do you want to produce so many pounds of beef off that pasture? Do you want to pull off so many um, bales of hay? What is really your end goal for that piece of ground? Again, looking at what type of soil you have, so that will kind of help determine your goal, kind of what you can achieve. What type, um, what do you want to, what do you want out of your plant species? There we go. Um, so are you going to be, want something that you can graze quickly, um, that'll grow back quickly? Do you want something that you just need to have green in the ground for the year while you think through things? Do you want something that's gonna be there for five, six, seven plus years without really having to put a whole lot of maintenance into it? Things like that. What are your livestock species that you're raising? Are you gonna be grazing them heavily on there? Um, obviously it's something like chickens, you're gonna be looking at something different than small ruminants, than horses, than pigs than beef animals. Um, so you've got to look at kind of your livestock species and kind of what are their preferences as well. And then do you have any market for any of your excess forage? So if you are mostly pasture based, maybe there's a year where you're blessed with excess forage. What are you going to do with it? Um, I remember from grad school, one of the questions that haunted me on one of my exit, <laughs> exit interviews was um, one of my professors had asked me, he's like, okay, you have pastures you have extra forages, what are you gonna do? I was trying to think of every single answer, answer possible to sound as smart as possible. And he looked at me, he's like, why don't you just make hay off of it? And I'm like, yeah, you could do that. <laughs> so I tried to make it so much harder than what it was actually was. So do you have an excess for that forages? Do you have a neighbor that you could talk to about making that hay? Um, things like that to consider. And then again, choosing your species variety. Brooke did a great job last week looking at different types of species. And there's also the great forage field guide. We're gonna be referring to it quite often um, to kind of look at the different species we have available to us, um, making sure you find that good seed salesman that you can trust that you know is selling a good product um, to talk through the different species. What are your needs? What are your wants? 
But again, looking at our seed, um, not just alfalfa seed, but all seed should have be certified and have a high pure live seed percentage. So again, that pure live seed is the seed that's going to germinate. So if you're buying a bag of feed um, or seed that has only 65, 70% germination rate or pure live seed, it's not going to be as well of a stand as something that's 85, 90%. So when we're looking at legumes and grasses, make sure you find a variety adapted to your area. There are a lot of great university studies all over there um, from Purdue University, from Michigan State, from University of Kentucky, Wisconsin. So find a state that's closest to where you're at um, and look at what those forage trials look like. Are there certain varieties that stand out and perform better than some of the others? Um, so those are studies that are kind of really interesting to look at. All right, so now we're going to get into kind of the meat and potatoes of it. How do we establish, how do we renovate, things like that. So when we're looking at establishment preparations, um, you want to look at the seed bed most, most importantly. So when we're talking about establishment, this is basically where we're taking a field that was either fallow, um, has been in CRP, has been in row crop production, things like that. Um, and basically turning it into, or it could have been even old pasture that you're just starting over with. Um, so unfortunately, this would be a case where we did till up the soil. Sorry, Mark. Um, but basically, you're going to want to prepare the seed bed as if you were preparing it for corn. Um, so you want it nice, smooth, light and fluffy, um, and then kind of go over the field just once more. Um, get that extra kind of little fluffiness to it, that softness, so that seed has a chance to go in the ground. Um, so when you walk on that seed bed, your foot shouldn't really sink in for more than about an inch deep. You can see here in this photo here. Um, so you do, are leaving a little bit of an impression, but you aren't sinking in, but you aren't staying on top as well. It's just right, like the three little, like the three bears would say. So if the field is overworked, um, a crust could form on the top of it after a rain and basically prevent our seedlings from emerging. Um, so we can get it basically to where it could be too fluffy. Um, so once you set those seeds in the ground, um, if you get a rain, you could get that crust just hard enough over the top once it dries out that those seedlings have a hard time pushing through. And then of course, fertilizing to meet our soil test numbers or needs of the forage. Um, so like Brad talked about looking at those forage tests making sure our pH is where it needs to be for the species we're planting, making sure our fertilizer is good. Um, and if you do need to adjust the pH, make sure you're doing that about six months in advance so you get enough time to really adjust that pH. Excuse me. And then provide adequate time for root establishment before grazing or harvesting. So that's really important because if we don't have our roots in the ground for our forages, for our grasses, our legumes, things like that, we're not gonna have a plant. Um, so it's very easy for a piece of machinery, so our cutting bars, things like that, or an animal coming by and grazing to kind of, even though you may have your blades sharp on your harvesting machine, you're still having that cutting action that's kind of pushing against the plant at times if your blades aren't sharp enough. And that pushing motion can just tip the plant over if it's not doesn't have a good establishment. Same when we're grazing. You have an animal coming along, munching, munching, and they're not necessarily just clipping it off, but they're pulling at the same time. So it's easy for that plant to get lifted up out of the ground. So you want to make sure you get good root establishment. It could usually it's about two, I would say about two, two and a half months. Um, would be a good time frame at least before you go out and harvest or graze. So looking at some more preparation. Um, obviously, you can go out and do some broadcast seeding before green up occurs in the spring. So for those of us in northern Indiana, about now would be about perfect. Uh, maybe the next couple of weekends to finish getting that done. Southern Indiana, you may be getting a little, little bit on the outside edge of it. Um, and so I drove, just did a quick trip to Missouri and back last weekend to pick up a goat kid, but there was a drastic difference in the level of greenness from up here to down southern kind of that area. Um, so you want to make sure that you don't have a lot of forages growing yet, because the faster the forages grow, the less or the more competition your seedlings are going to have. 
You can also cut or graze your stand to the point that you think most of your seed um, when broadcasted can reach a soil surface. So that could be a case where you go out there and do a quick graze this spring um, and then graze it down a little bit farther than what you normally would, maybe about the two, two and a half inch range, just so you open up that canopy more and then go, go back in immediately and broadcast seed into it um, or broadcast seed just before you graze. That way the animals can help tramp that seed into the ground would work as well. And then of course, testing your soil for the pH um, phosphorus, potassium, things like that. So, and then consider dragging the field with our harrow after or as the seed is being broadcast. Um, so these are pictures that my dad had done here a couple of years ago um, when they were out kind of reestablishing, um, kind of helping rejuvenate some of their pastures. Um, so you can see first picture back he was broadcast seeding and now he's bringing this equipment along behind to make sure we get that good seed to soil contact. Um, so it helps reduce some of the competition to our young seedlings um, and things like that. And then, so if we're broadcast seeding about now, May timeframe, you could probably turn the animals back out or you could go out and take a harvest off of it. So again, real quick, um, this is from the forage field guide. Um, but we can see here our mineral, um, our pH levels of where certain forages prefer over others. Um, so we have our alfalfa, sweet clover, barley, things like that. They like a little bit higher pH. So about that six, seven to about seven, seven time, seven, seven scale frame. Um, more acid tolerant. Um, so we have more of our grasses, our birds with true foil, our clovers, things like that. They're a lot more tolerant. So anywhere from about a six to a seven is good for most of those species. And then you've got the hairy vetch um, that can go down to about as low as about five, four, five, three. But if you have pH that low, you're gonna have a lot of problems getting other things to grow with it. So really check your pH of your soils before you're out there putting seed in the ground. So our seed preparation, um, Brooke did a great job with this last week, so we won't talk about it too much. But again, our legume seeds must be inoculated with proper rhizobium bacteria to make sure we get that good nitrogen fixation. Um, so if the field hasn't been planted in clover or alfalfa, something like that prior to this, you may need to add inoculant to your seed um, when you put it in the, in the seed box. Um, it could be that it's a coated seed that already has the inoculate in it, which makes it really nice. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, but basically what that rhizobium does is it gets that nitrogen fixation really working in our legumes um, to really get the best benefit for that plant, which in turn gives great nitrogen in the soil for our grasses and other species. You can see here, these are just examples of what we could plant our seeding rates at if we're doing pure pastures, pure hay fields, or if we're doing mixed. Um, so obviously the more you mix in, the less you're gonna have of everything just because you don't wanna overcrowd. Um, the less you have, the more you could put in of those species. And again, fertilization real quick. Um, obviously a soil test needs to be taken. Um, at least six months before you're seeding in a new area or if you're renovating a pasture, things like that, just so you have an idea of where you're at. What are those adjustments that you need to make? Um, if your pH is low, making sure you're adding lime. Um, if it's too high, making sure you're adding sulfur um, and going from there. So we can see here um, kind of our nitrogen ranges for our alpha, alpha, alpha grasses and clover. Um, and this is basically looking at kind of those uppermost areas of the plant, kind of what's going to take up the most of our nutrients and kind of where, where we need to look when we're testing. So you can see alfalfa um, is going to have a lot more nitrogen needs than some of our other plants just because it's fixing. Sorry. We'll, have, we'll contain a lot more nitrogen. There we go. Than our grasses and things because it is a legume. It's fixing those, that nitrogen and such. So, all right, so we've got our seed bed prepared. Um, we have our pastures prepared, things like that, PA fields. Now we're gonna plant into them. So that's our next topic here. So timing of seeding. 
I would say it varies a little bit. Um, so we have great um, guidance in the forage field guide in terms of a rough, rough guideline. Um, but in Northern Indiana, um, a lot of our perennials um, you do a little bit in the spring, but mostly you'd want to do them in the fall, get them well established um, before a frost comes in or a freezing, freezing frost. Um, so about that mid, early to mid-August, um, late August time frame would be best, especially if we've had a good year where we had good moisture. Um, if you have a year where you haven't had as much moisture, you may want to plant it earlier in August just to give those seeds a little bit better time to get established. Southern Indiana, you can plant through early September to mid-September um, just because you guys stay a little bit warmer than us up here normally. Um, but the rule of thumb is to give yourself about six weeks of good growth, um, basically from the time that plant germinates to the time that it gets killed off by a frost. So it's not just the date you put the seed in the ground, but it's the date that that seed starts germinating that you want to give it six weeks out. And again, that spring seed is also possible um, early to mid-April, um, as soon as that soil is dried enough and is warmed up enough to be worked well. Um, to make sure those seeds germinate. Because again, some of our seeds need warmer temperature, like teff. Teff needs its soils to be about 65 degrees. Some of our others can be about 50, 55 degrees to germinate. So, all right, and then we've got our broadcast seeding that can happen with our red clovers and such and kind of that February, March time frame once the frost is out of the ground, for the most part. You do want a little bit of that heaving action to help work it in. Um, but basically our goal, um, especially broadcast seeding, is to uniformly distribute the correct amount of seed and cover that seed with about a quarter of an inch of soil, um, making a good, good contact between that seed and that soil. You don't need a lot of soil on top of it. It's not like we're planting a soybean seed or a corn seed or something like that. Just a little bit of soil on top is all it really needs. So these are a few different types of cedars, planters that are out there. Um, we'll mention real quick. So we have a call packer cedar or a brilliant cedar as it's probably more commonly known. Really good method for good seed to soil contact. Um, it's a good option when you're doing something, when you're starting from literally the ground up. Um, it's not so great for no-till situations, but it's definitely a lot better when you're starting with a clean field. Um, just because it has all the equipment right there, the seed goes in the ground, that colopacker comes in right behind it and gets it in the gets that good soil contact. We have the band cedar as well. Um, this is kind of used more often in maybe some larger commercial operations. Um, so basically, we have our seed tube extenders. You can see there towards the bottom of the photo um, that gets that seed really close to that soil surface. Um, and then we have a band of fertilizer that goes right alongside it that helps support it. And so when we're establishing seed under harsh conditions, um, so if we have issues with um, seeds, with fertilizer, things like that, this would be a good option if you really need to get that fertilizer next to it. We've got a grain drill. Um, so I'm sure many of us have this option kind of sitting around. So the grain drill can be modified and used for our legumes, um, our small grasses, things like that. Not quite as effective as some of the other methods above. Um, just because there is a little bit more distance for that seed to fall. Um, we aren't necessarily directly putting fertilizer next to it in the ground, um, but it is an option. It will work if, we, if needed. Then we have our broadcast seeding, like we talked about, um, really good for lamb that's hilly um, or conventional tillage isn't practical. So I know for many of us in Southern Indiana, um, some of our hills and dales get a little, little scary at times, um, driving across it with excessive equipment. Um, so it may be where you even have to take out a hand broadcast cedar and walk some of your pastures. Um, this works really well for our red clover, a um, little bit for some of our perennial grasses, but not really well for the alfalfa just because that alfalfa needs a little special care when getting to the ground. And then the no-till planting, um, like we talked about. So really good for planting some of our small seeded grasses, some of our legumes, things like that, into an existing pasture. Um, so this would be a great, great choice for renovating pastures. 
Um, so our existing vegetation, like we talked about, needs to be really short in the ground um, just because once it starts growing, it's gonna be really hard for our new seeding to compete with it to get the growth that it needs. So spring seedings are preferred if you're going to no-till plant just because there should be better moisture content in the ground to get that seed a better chance of getting going. So that's kind of some of our planter options. So if you've never actually worked with a planter, um, looking at drill, things like that, this is kind of the basic makeup um, of what most, most of our drills kind of look like. So here at the top, we have, let me get my, laser up here, I'll just use the mouse. So here at the top, we have kind of our seed hopper boxes. So we have larger ones for larger seeds, smaller ones for smaller seeds. Um, we have our dr different drop tubes. So where the seeds come down through these tubes and get closer to the ground. And then we have our press wheel. This is kind of the front of the, front of the drill right here. So we have a rolling coulter. So it'll make kind of an indent in the ground. Um, we have our disc opener, so the seed comes through here, kind of keeps that ground open for the seed to go in. And then our press wheel comes back behind in the same line and kind of presses some soil over that seed. It's kind of the, the basics of how a drill works. So to calibrate a drill, these are kind of the little tools that you'll need to make sure that you're getting the correct amount of seed out of there that you need. So a container to catch your seed. So something as simple as a plastic baggie and a rubber band works just fine. Um, you might need a tape measure to determine how the circumference of your drive wheel and disc opener spacing, because we'll look at that in part of our calculations. You want some flags. So if you're gonna be actually driving a line, you wanna make sure you know when you need to start measuring and when you need to stop measuring. Um, a floor or a bottle jack if you're going to be doing stationary calibration in the shop, um, which now would be a great time for it. It's still a little cool outside, but you can get everything set and ready to go and roll for here in a couple of weeks. And then you want to make sure you have a scale that has up to a tenth of a gram accuracy on it. So you can really get down to kind of the finesse of those numbers to make sure you're getting the right amount out that you need. So. When we go to calibrate, obviously the first thing you want to know, you want to do, which I know is going to be hard for some people, but you do want to read your drills operator manual. You want to make sure you know how it works. You want to make sure where all the lever levers are, things like that, how the adjustments are made. Um, so make sure you read that operator manual. Um, make sure your seed tubes are not blocked. This is probably the most important step. Um, so even if you bought a new piece of machinery, um, if it's still used or gently used, how long was it sitting in the other barn? Rats and mice really love to use those, those tubes as little nesting spots. Who knows how many of your tubes may be blocked and that's gonna affect your seeding rate. So use your seeding rate chart to set your drill that you can find in your operator manual or on the drill itself. And then select your proper gearbox setting or drive gear. Um, again, that's gonna be, um, on your, in your operator manual, and then um, you can move the levers as you need to. And then that's when we're gonna go ahead and place a small amount of seed um, above each opening in the proper seed box. Um, so if we're using smaller seeds, we'll use a small seed box. If we're using larger seeds, like if you're planting forage bean, soybeans, something like that, you can use the larger box. From that point, you're gonna lower your drill to engage your seeding mechanism and then turn the seed mechanism until the seed comes out. This can either be driving in that straight line for 150 feet, um, because that's just kind of our, our general measure, um, makes kind of our figuring out our pounds that are coming out a little bit easier. So you can either drive in a straight line for 150 feet, or this is where you come in and look at um, the circumference of your drive wheel and figure out how many revolutions you're gonna to have to take to get to that 150 feet. Um, oh, I got ahead of myself, hold that thought. So you're gonna turn the seeding mechanism till the seed comes out just so you know it's engaged and ready to go. 
Then you want to disconnect three to five seed tubes. And then at the bottom of each of those seed tubes is when you'll put the basically rubber banded baggie onto the bottom of those seed tubes. So that way you'll be collecting that seed that comes out to make our calculations to make sure the right amount of seed is coming out. And then you'll pull the drill for about 150 feet or turn that drive wheel the number of times to equal 150 feet. So if you're just gonna manually turn the drive wheel, um, easy way to figure out the number of revolutions you need to do is just divide 150 by pi, which is 3.14 and multiplied by the diameter of our drive wheel. So it could be you only have to turn it 10 times. It could be you have to turn it 16 and three quarters times. You have to be very careful, make sure you get that correct amount. Um, but make sure you have the correct calculations done on your number of revolutions if you're gonna do it in a stationary manner. So once you've gotten your seed collected, um, you wanna carefully remove your containers um, with that seed in it. So it could be, if you're doing it in a stationary manner, you could put little plastic seed tubs under it. Um, if you're doing it where it's moving and you're driving, you obviously wanna have the plastic baggies. Um, but then you just place that an empty container similar to that one um, on the scale and make sure you tear it. That way, when you put the, sub, the containers that are filled with seed on the scale, you aren't having to take out the weight of that container. Then you're gonna go in and weigh each filled seed collection container. Um, so it's just um, making sure you get the right weight of the seed from each container. Then add all those weights up together um, and divide by the number of seed tubes you collected from. So let's say we collected from five seed tubes and we collected a total of, I don't know, 100, 100 grams, make it easy. Um, so you divide, take that 100, divide it by the five seed tubes and you're gonna end up with basically 20 gram, an average of 20 grams um, coming out Per, per seed tube, per disc opener. And then you compare that average weight per disc opener to kind of um, this really nice handy table that's been provided by um, Forge or Progressive Forage. Um, so this is really good, good information, um, a really nice chart to have, and I'll include it in a PDF in the email I send out after we get done. Um, but basically it looks at the distance between um, the disc openers. So if you have six, seven, seven and a half, or eight inches, and then it looks at what our ideal seeding rate is going to be in pounds per acre. So let's say we want to plant something at 14 pounds per acre, and we have a seven inch disc opener. We should, if everything went correctly and everything was set correctly, we should get an average of 12.8 grams of seed per disc opener in our calibration test. If you are, before I get ahead of myself, nope. so if you are under 10%, um, either over or under for that number um, on this chart, kind of your ideal kind of setting, um, if you're within that 10% range or less, um, you're good to go. You're good to roll in the field. If you're over 10% or under 10, if, yeah, if you're over 10% off um, from that number, then you need to go back and kind of re redo some of your settings. Um, if you have too much seed coming out, obviously closing those holes down a little bit more. If you have too little seed, opening those, those yeah, seed holes up a little bit is what you'll need to do. If you have any other questions about how to calibrate a drill, um, Progressive Forage Grower, Kentucky for University of Kentucky did a great um, demonstration of how to do that with this calibration video. And again, I'll include that link um, in the email. So last little few words of caution here when we're looking at establishment, renovation, things like that of our pastures is like, like Brooke talked about last week is kind of our alfalfa toxicity. Um, so it's just the compound that an alfalfa plant produces um, just so there's not extra competition as that plant ages um, from new alfalfa plants being planted near it. So I've always been told if you take a 55 gallon drum and set it over an alfalfa plant, anywhere within that drum is gonna be the range of where those toxins are from that alfalfa plant. Um, so if you go to plant in new alfalfa into an existing alfalfa field, 
you're going to have a really hard time getting it established. Um, last week, Brooke had talked about giving it at least a year rest. Um, I would recommend at least six months rest between when you work up the field from the previous alfalfa to the new alfalfa seeding. A year would be best um, just because you're giving it time to get that toxin out of the soil so your new stand of alfalfa will be the best that it can. And then seeding year management depends on whether a companion crop, um, so if you put something else in there, if it's a current pasture that you just planted into, things like that. Um, if there are weeds, insects, other diseases that could be present. Um, so if you start to see a lot of weed seeds pop, cropping up, you're gonna need to do something to kind of smother those or cut those back. Um, so you give your new seeding the best chance possible, um, whether it's going in and doing a quick cut um, when those seedlings are still small, but those weeds may be growing, just kind of stunt those and throw those weeds back. Um, again, making sure you're not harvesting within six weeks prior to that first killing frost, because even if you have a good established pasture, um, hay field after that first year, you want to make sure that they stay good and well established going into the fall season. And then whether you're dealing with a high management or a low management perennial forage, um, a successful establishment phase is essential to a long lived and productive stand. So making sure that you follow some of these steps, um, making sure that you get a good establishment of your pastures and hay fields, because the longer your seeds in the ground, um, the less time you'll have to have to work on it. Obviously you can tweak it um, routinely here and there if you want to, but the less money you'd have to spend on it than if you did uh, just kind of threw seed out there and just try to see what grow. So. So with that, again, we want to try to get the best best establishment that we can, whether we're renovating pastures, whether we're starting a new field, things like that. So we want to make sure that we have nice and green and not so much in the weedy and thorny category. So with that, thank you all. And I, I and Mark would be happy to enter, entertain any questions you may have at this time. So you can either unmute or you can put it in the chat box. Alicia, this is Keith Johnson. Yes, Keith. So you mentioned the uh, mice nest situation. I can tell you a little story that wasn't quite that large of a problem. I actually was going to do a variety testing at a farmer's field uh, many years ago. Got the job done, felt like things just went exceptional. Um, came back at emergence time and there was a road that had not um, germinated anything. Got to evaluating the situation, it was a spider nest is all it was. It was a little spider <laughs> web. And ever since that time, I make sure something's coming out of each tube and, uh, you know, look for those problems and don't wait until the <laughs> thing has emerged. So it kind of ruined uh, a good variety program, that's for sure. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think it's important to make sure that we have uh, good flow through a seed and uh, to make sure that it is uniform, like you're suggesting among the tubes, uh, is a good plan. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Well, if there are no questions, again, um, we'll get this recording posted on the YouTube channel. So it'll be available for you to go back and watch. And like I said, I'll try to include um, some of these resources we've talked about in the email that I'll send out to you all last, next week. So thank you, Mark, again, for coming on today. I appreciate it. And thank you all for being with us today. Thank you very much. I enjoyed being with you uh, today and uh, get an opportunity. If you've got any questions or anything, give us a call. Yep, certainly. All right. Thank you, everybody.